Hey, welcome to my channel. My name is Bridget and I'm here to answer all your art questions to give you the confidence you need to make the artwork of your dreams. In this video, I show you different brush strokes and how to use them, as well as a whole painting using those techniques. Check out my previous video to learn everything you need to start an acrylic painting so you can practice with me. These are some of the strokes each brush can make. All these strokes are wet on dry, meaning the brush is wet and the canvas is dry. Different strokes will happen when you use wet on wet, as you'll see later in this video, and dry brush techniques. In order, I am using a round brush, a filbert brush, a fan brush, a small detail brush, and a square brush. I'm using them on their sides, their tips, twirling them, etc. to give you a better understanding of some of the strokes they can make. I encourage you to experiment either on a separate piece of paper or on a practice canvas with your own brush strokes because you can make a lot more than what I've shown you here. I hope that through this video you'll be able to pick out the right paint brushes you need to make your painting. I recommend getting a variety of paint brushes in both size and shape. You'll also learn which brushes you gravitate towards the most and feel most comfortable using. There are a couple methods of blending colors. The first method I show you, I paint using vertical brush strokes along the center line between the colors while moving them slightly from side to side. Don't rotate the brush or the colors will become muddy. The second method I show you, I take a tight zigzag line down the center line between the two colors. Then I paint using the vertical brush strokes from the first method. Now that I've shown you various brush strokes, let's make a painting. When painting, start with the background, meaning everything you want to appear far away. Once the background is painted, you can move to the midground. Once the midground is painted, you can paint the foreground. Anything you want to recede, that is, you want to look like it's further back, paint using light, cool colors, and anything that you want to appear in the foreground, that is anything closer to the viewer, use bold colors with lots of detail. You'll see what I mean. I begin with horizontal strokes for the sky. And in this case, hindsight is 2020, and the second I started painting, I knew I should have used a bigger brush. So lesson learned, if you are painting a large area, use a large brush. It'll save you a lot of time.
Once the main color of the sky was painted, I dabbed or stippled some white into the cloud shapes while the blue was still wet. When both colors are wet, they blend together. If you notice a color is not popping the way you want it to, you can either build it up by waiting for the first layer to dry and then painting on top of it again, or you can use contrast, that is making the area around it a little bit darker or lighter. Moving on to the midground, I start with the tree line. I'm first painting the tops of the trees, outlining where I want them before I move on to filling them in. I start with my lighter colors first, because it's easier to go darker than lighter. For this painting, I'm using a limited color palette, staying in the family of colors I used to show you the brush strokes. Normally, I would add a lot more color, and in fact, I still want to add more colors to it now that the painting is complete. Um, I might do that still. Follow me on Instagram to see if I actually go through with adding more colors. I would just love to add some burnt sienna to the tree branches. I'm very tempted. Okay. I'm adding green into the yellow, trying to mimic the texture of trees depending on the type of tree it is. For the big leafy trees, I use dabbing or stippling, but for the evergreen trees, I hold my round brush on an angle and tap it. I'm just experimenting with whatever I think looks or feels right. I recommend experimenting with your brushes too, with all the techniques I showed you earlier and more. You can come up with your own strokes as well. Have fun with it! I'm layering and building up colors based on what I think looks good or what's needed. I've picked a spot where the light source is in my painting and I'm making sure that all the light spots reflect that. You'll notice that all the trees are lighter at the top and on the right. That's because that's where I've decided to put my light source, without actually painting my light source, that is. For the water, I'm using all the same colors I've already used because water reflects whatever is around it. I try to mirror image the tree line in the water. It doesn't have to be perfect because this water isn't going to be completely still. There will still be some ripples. I make some of the same zigzags with the green where the shadows are while the yellow paint is still wet.
Again, this is a part where I should have used a bigger brush. <laughs> it would have saved me a lot of grief, so learn from me. Use a big brush to create the ripples. Using a clean, big brush and a light hand, you're going to gently glide your hand... No. You're going to gently glide your brush over the wet paint. <laughs> Don't put your hand in this, oh my gosh. <laughs> because I'm using a small brush, I go back and forth like a zillion times to try to keep the ripples even. A big brush will save you this time and effort. Don't fear big brushes. They are your friend. <laughs> Don't be like me. <laughs> save yourself. Now I'm editing the tree line's reflection in the water. I'm going to paint the blue from the sky between each of the treetops reflection. I'm trying to work quickly because acrylic paint dries quickly and we need it to be wet to blend. I'm focusing mostly on where the colors transition to create the water effect. Thankfully, I've now picked up a larger brush, but it's still not as large as I should be using. I think the three inch brush or even a fan brush is what I should have been using for the ripples, but oh well, you use what you have and you make do. You become a better painter either way. <laughs> If you want to make a gradient, such as you see here with the water at the bottom, you never want to lift your brush. You always want to keep it moving horizontally back and forth as you move your brush up and down between the two colors. If you jump from the blue to the green, you'll put blue in the part of the green that you don't want blue to be in, and suddenly you won't have a nice gradient anymore. You'll have a weird streaky mess or one solid color. So yeah, try not to lift your brush. Don't forget to add your clouds to the reflection as well.
Using a small, thin brush, I am gently and lightly creating tree branches. They start off bigger towards the trunk or where the trunk would be, and they get thinner as they branch out. Uh -huh. <laughs> I try to vary their size and shape, making them look as natural as possible. So as I'm doing this, let me tell you a bit about brushes. Some brushes are higher quality than others. If you get them at a dollar store, they're more likely to be poor quality compared to something you buy at an art store. You can buy a variety pack at an art store for a reasonable price, like 15 brushes for $35 or something like that. Brushes individually can cost a minimum of $10 and get more expensive the bigger you get. Painting is an investment. These brushes should last you years to a lifetime if you take care of them. If you take care of them, they'll take care of you. I'll put out another video for how to clean and care for your brushes, and I'm going to tell you right now, it's not environmentally friendly. I'm sorry, it's not. It sucks. Um, I recommend that you put pressure on art suppliers to come up with environmentally friendly ways of art making, environmentally friendly paints. I don't know. You could also support artists who are environmentally friendly, who are researching and actively changing the way we make art for the better of the earth. I'm stippling dark green with a round brush to give the illusion of leaves or needles. I'm focusing on bunches, leaving some of the branch exposed. This is what I've observed in nature at least. Um, not every part of the branch is covered in leaves, only certain parts depending on the branch and depending on the tree.
That's it for this video. If you like it, give it a like, leave a comment if you have a question, and subscribe if you want to see more. Thanks for watching!